Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the one hour chart of silver from netdania.com. I know a number of the members talked about how they're unable to bring up the netdania charts on uh, Firefox anymore. This, I'm, I'm running Firefox right now. Now, occasionally I have to go in and uh, click on an OK for the flash. Sometimes it doesn't allow it. Um, if you get that warning sign, you can click on allow and remember and it'll let you in. So I, I've had that issue for quite a while and I just click through it. So now I did notice on NetDania's site that they've enabled cookies, they say, and cookies are a pretty standard thing now with the internet. Basically it tracks um, where you've been, excuse me, where you've been and where you're coming from. And you really have to allow cookies to a certain extent to get websites to work. So it might be that uh, your cookies are completely turned off. You might want to look at that. So uh, here is the current pennant formation that Silver seems to be forming. It looks like a decent pennant. Uh, it's not textbook, but it is uh, fairly textbook. Uh, you can see that we're up above the pennant area now. And uh, we're definitely going to get a resolution. Now, the powers that be, uh, they know that we watch these formations. They also watch these formations. And uh, just with traditional technical analysis in a bull move, a pennant is just the most bullish thing you can see. Uh, about 80% of the time, they resolve to the upside. Now with silver, that's not the case because they actually are aware that uh, people are watching that and uh, you have the Ted Butler type of Raptors versus the commercials versus all these people basically buying and selling paper back and forth. And they're watching them as well. So barring a big smackdown, and that can happen at any time, uh, this one definitely looks to be going higher. Now, we've had some moves here. Let me just look at some markets here. We've had some moves in the, the Euros, very strong right now. Uh, the Japanese Yen is, is getting stronger. Um, oil was getting a lot stronger, but is now starting to round down. Uh, we have a lot of strange things going on in the currencies. I'm not gonna go into all those because I don't really have time. Um, so the main topic of the night is going to be uh, guns and gold and, and what that means. But there's some stories we have to cover before we get to that. So let's start off with the Illinois pension crisis. Now, this is something that longtime members know that I harp on all the time. And the reason why is because it's my view that uh, as we become more and more of a, I guess I would say, communist state, uh, as, as the cloward piven strategy moves forward, where they get more and more people dependent upon the government for their livelihood, for their wealth, for everything, then that gives them more leverage about threatening to pull the plug. And uh, you can see uh, one of the things that's always threatened is the dependent people on pensions. You can see here now, Illinois is to delay pension payments. Now we know Illinois is in a really bad situation. Uh, I covered it before, so I'm not gonna go into the details, but uh, you know, these pension systems have completely unrealistic uh, return expectations. Um, Obviously, in a zero interest rate environment, the assumed return should be zero. Uh, that's pretty obvious, but they continue to project eight, nine, and 10% returns. So it's not a surprise that the pensions are not gonna be paid. And uh, I've warned so many times, uh, I, I'm out of breath about how if you're depending upon someone else to pay you, you're probably going to be disappointed. You have to take charge of your own retirement, take charge of your own future, because uh, if you're depending on a government promise, then you're going to be disappointed. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk about here is the mortgage issue, and a number of members have asked what my opinion is on that. 
So I'm going to play a little bit of this uh, Rick Ackerman interview with uh, Greg Hunter, and then I'm going to comment. Uh, some people say, uh, Jim Sinclair, one of them says, well, if they do have hyperinflation, they'll pass a law and they'll just uh, re, uh, reissue the mortgages in the new currency. And they'll have a new currency and they'll reissue the mortgages in a new currency. I think, think, I think we, we can already see how it'll play out. Um, you know, the idea I've carried in my head for a long time was that uh, all mortgage uh, contracts would over time come to resemble uh, tenant uh, landlord agreements that we would effectively be leasing our homes. And that's true in a de facto way now because, uh, you know, there's no market for first-time buyers. They're all kind of renting, so nobody's owning. And I think the trend toward less ownership will extend to people who actually are living in homes paying mortgages. So I think that's how mortgage debt will settle out. We're essentially going to be in uh, lease arrangements with the mortgage uh, creditors. Now, so we want to think about, there's a number of issues here that we need to think about. And first of all, just based on a standard analysis of whether or not uh, it's best to pay off your mortgage, that's one of the first question, uh, first questions that's asked, uh, should I pay off my mortgage? Now, just based on a standard analysis, the answer is that depends on interest rates. So if you can imagine you are in, say, the interest rate environment that we were in in the 80s or even maybe the 90s, where you're talking about a, um, a mortgage that you're paying an 8% interest rate. Some people paid off in the 80s 10% or 12% mortgages. Now, if you have a mortgage, and, and again, this has to be in the context of the real interest rate, not the nominal interest rate, because a nominal interest rate doesn't give you any information at all. So to explain that, wh wh what I'm talking about is the nominal interest rate is the interest rate minus inflation compared to inflation. So it doesn't matter if you have a... a uh, interest rate instrument yielding 20% if you have a 40% inflation rate. Then again, if you have a uh, in interest rate, uh, say a T-bill like happened in the 80s that's yielding 20% and interest rates have fallen now down to 10%, then that's a tremendous deal. So same thing with mortgages. Right now, I can only use myself as an example. I have a mortgage and I am not interested in paying it off. I have a 30-year mortgage at 4%. Now, um, the question you have to ask yourself is, what is the real rate of inflation? What is the return on other things that you could be putting your money into? So if you're paying 4% interest on your mortgage and you can find an investment that you think is going to return more than 4% over the 30-year period that your mortgage exists, then you're probably better off putting your money in those investments rather than paying off your mortgage. Now that's just one factor. The other factor that's being discussed here, and this is a really important factor, is will these mortgage contracts uh, be honored if there's a new currency system? In other words, I signed a mortgage contract to uh, refinance my mortgage based on dollars. I owe X amount of dollars. Now, what happens if the dollar is redefined? Uh, what happens if we have a new currency issued? What is the legal status of those mortgages? Will they change that into the new currency? Now, a lot of silver stackers and gold stackers have um, gone on the idea that they're going to stack silver and gold and when the dollar value of those change, they're going to be able to sell a few coins and pay off their mortgage. Uh, that may or may not be the case. Uh, so we don't know what they're going to do with the laws. We do know that we have a precedent that they just simply don't obey contracts or laws at all. Um, we've had numerous defaults where 
the credit default swaps should have paid off, but they didn't because they said it wasn't a default. They said it was something else. So there's definitely a precedent for them bending the rules. So on that issue, I would say um, it's probably better for you to not pay off your mortgage, even though you may not be able to get away with paying uh, with the cheaper dollars. Now, the other issue is who's going to end up owning these mortgages? I think it's a pretty good bet that the Federal Reserve is going to end up owning everything. That seems to be the game plan. That seems to be end game. That uh, the Federal Reserve is just going to create money out of nothing, buy up all the debt, and you'll probably have the Federal Reserve as your creditor. Now, that would tend to argue for paying your mortgage off completely if you believe you can get clear title for it. Uh, and that brings up the whole issue of the MERS system and whether or not your mortgage and the original papers are in that system, whether you have a clean uh, title to your house. Now, if you have a clean title to your house and you believe that the Federal Reserve is going to end up owning all mortgages, then you may want to get that title in your hands so that you're not a renter um, from the Fed. We've seen precedent with the Obamacare and how it's connected to the IRS that uh, you definitely don't want the government to be your landlord. So that's another issue. Um, there are so many issues here. Uh, the other issue is which bank holds your mortgage and where you have your debts. Personally, the way I have everything set up, and this isn't investment advice, I'm just telling you what I have set up. I have my mortgage, my bank account, my credit cards, and everything with Chase. And uh, as far as I know, it's a clean MERS title, and um, I pay off my mortgage as slowly as I can, and the main reason I do that is because I want to have the ability to walk away. Um, I want to be able to say if things change drastically, uh, be able to say to the bank, okay, here's my house, uh, you own it, you take it, and I can move into a renting situation if I need to. So based on all those factors, and there's a lot of factors, um, I tend to side with having a low interest rate on a 30-year, paying the minimum, and uh, keeping the possibility of walking away available to you. That's my view. That may change, but that's currently where I stand. So let's get over to the main issue, and that's going to be this uh, guns and gold issue. And I'm going to start off with this article from uh, SRS Rocco, and this is about the dollar deathbed dynamics U.S. suffers two-year gold mine supply deficit. And I want to talk about this because we're going to listen in a, in a minute here to the interview with Jeff Nielsen on SGT Report. But uh, we have this issue that's just behind the scenes constantly of the gold supply, um, the gold repatriation issue, how much is being mined, um, I'm just going to try to summarize it. For me, there's really only three major players. Now, I think that probably in the future, there's going to be emerging a fourth player. But right now, as far as I can tell in the gold situation, there are three major players. There's the United States, and I consider the U.S. and Britain to be the head of the Western system. The Western system is the U.S., Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, and various parts of Europe and various parts of the Middle East. Then we have the Chinese and Asian system. That's another system. And then we have the Russian system. So these are the three major players. Now, the first thing you need to think about is that two of these players uh, are mining gold and not exporting it. And that's where we get to this story here. Um, the, the U.S. is actually exporting more than they're mining. And this is where it gets really strange. 
So we'll read a little bit of this. As the death of the world's reserve currency grows closer, the U.S. continues to export one heck of a lot of gold. Matter of fact, the U.S. exported so much gold over the past three years, it suffered a deficit large enough to equal two years worth of its domestic mine supply. This should be no surprise as to precious metal investors as 99% of Americans continue to believe debts are assets. I mean, why should Americans invest in the barbarous gold relic when their wealth comes much easier via their monthly retirement statement? Sure, their retirement balance continues to go down each month, but this is just a mere setback. Nothing to worry about, especially when they vote in Donald Trump as president. Double and triple digit gains for everyone. Well, that sounds real nice until you look under the U.S. financial hood and see what's going on with the Federal Reserve Motor. I would recommend anyone who hasn't seen the video by John Titus. And by the way, I uh, have heard that he's put out a new one, so we're going to have to look at that one soon. Um, not only did the Fed purchase worthless mortgage-backed securities from top banks for $1.7 trillion, Titus believes the Fed has understated the amount of U.S. Treasuries on its balance sheet, etc., uh, so he goes into the figures here for U.S. gold supply, and you add them together, something's not adding up. You can see the U.S. gold market has a net deficit, and so this is shocking stuff. I don't have time to go into it, uh, but I wanted to jump over to the interview with Jeff Nielsen on uh, SGT Report and talk about um, this gold repatriation and gold um, gold possession issue. I'm going to talk about guns and gold after we listen to this. Now, we know that the Germans wanted their gold back, and the New York Fed really couldn't accommodate getting their gold back, and that became a big news story. Well, now you're writing that the German Central Bank accounts for all its gold in a 2,300-page document. This is fascinating to me, Jeff, because, of course, it would be the Germans who say, oh, there's no problem. You know, no need to look over here. Here's 2,300 pages uh, for you to understand why. Tell us about this incredible story. Well, here we need to back up a little bit in, in history to sort of look at this whole silly, quote unquote, repatriation melodrama. And going back, I guess it's more than a year and a half now, Germany's government, uh, under considerable political pressure, made a formal request to have some of its gold returned to it, quote-unquote, repatriated. From the New York portion, Fed. Uh, from, and a small portion was also to come from France. And, of course, the point here is the total amount of gold that Germany was requesting to get back was only about 20% of its entire reserves. So it's not like it was even trying to, to recapture the entire 3,000-plus tons which the German government still pretends to have title to. It was simply trying to get back 20% of that gold. And, and even more ludicrous is this repatriation program was to be spread over multiple years. Well, as if as if transporting a few hundred tons of gold it was some logistical operation that couldn't be handled in a few weeks. So, you know, the entire proposal was ludicrous. And then as it unfolded, what we actually saw was Germany getting nothing. In, in the first year of, of this, this scheme, basically the only gold that actually made it back onto German soil was a tiny dribble of gold that came from France, practically nothing at all came from the U.S. And then, of course, things get really surreal. During this period of time, we get this other report surfacing in the media that suddenly the Netherlands government has managed to, quote unquote, secretly repatriate uh, a big chunk of its gold reserves. More than 100 tons of gold, uh, 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 which is a significantly larger percentage of its total reserves, and it got all of its gold apparently in just a few weeks. So, of course, this immediately uh, raised a lot of eyebrows, and, and, and my first reaction was to treat this as, as a serious news item, that somehow Den the Netherlands had gotten its gold back, very possibly as quid pro quo for uh, cooperation so. in, in some of the U.S.'s geopolitical schemes. Yeah. But then, of course we get at this further, even more bizarre twist, which is suddenly we get this announcement from Germany that instead of the public and open repatriation of gold, which was 
originally proposed, which presumably would have involved open shipments, we now get this notice, uh, this notification from Germany's government that it is, quote unquote, secretly repatriated some of its gold. It could. Okay, so that gives you an idea of the issue. Now, I want to pull up a world map and just talk about this issue of guns and gold and what this means. So if we look at the world based upon the last paradigm, which was the uh, setting up of the borders after the World War II resolution, because that's really the situation we're in, is how the world was set up post-World War II. So we really have these areas of influence. We have the North American, and I will include South American areas, and I'm going to go, go ahead and include uh, most of Europe. We've got a, a battle over the Ukraine right now, and then we've got these hot spots here in Africa. Uh, but uh, Africa is about half and half between various powers. We're really not sure how that's going to shake out. So we have the Western powers, and that includes Australia. Then we have Russia and their sphere of influence, and then China and their sphere of influence. Now, I would like to include India in the Chinese sphere of influence. Basically, what we have is the mining of gold in the Russian area, the Russian sphere. They're not exporting any of that gold. They're stacking that gold. Same thing in the Asian area. They're stacking that gold. Now, in the Western area, what we see is that the areas where the West, the United States, and Great Britain still have military power, they still have guns on the ground. Because you have to remember, even in Germany, there is no military defending Germany. That includes Japan. This is World War II. Uh, and also a lot of North Africa. These happen to be the areas where we've seen the U.S. quote-unquote liberate these areas. Of course, then they've liberated the gold. So this western area, this is the area where uh, they're said to be independent countries, but we find that uh, if there's an issue of gold, then it always defaults to the United States. Now, my guess is that the United States is currently draining gold from all areas of influence where it's being mined in South America and in Africa and where it's been stored. So if you remember with the FOFOA analysis of the petrodollar, we know that many of these North African nations, including Libya, and uh, you can throw in there Iraq and uh, others, even uh, Ukraine, where the gold was reportedly looted uh, that the only issue really is guns on the ground. Who has the guns on the ground? So where Russia has guns on the ground, they're not giving up their gold. Where China has their guns and maybe India and the rest of Asia, they're not giving up their gold. They're not exporting it. But the United States is exporting gold and apparently one would guess that the United States has no more gold. So basically they're extorting gold from the areas where they still have guns on the ground. And of course in the Middle East, um, we, quote unquote, we have been increasing the number of guns on the ground and especially Libya and others, then all of a sudden the gold disappears. So this is the issue. Do you have the guns to defend your gold? Germany does not. Britain does not. Uh, most of North Africa does not. Certainly South America does not. And in the areas where those countries don't have the guns to defend their gold, their gold is flowing east to the countries that have the ability to defend their gold. These are the same countries and areas that are not exporting gold. So it's a in my mind right now, it's a tripartite world. I'm going to include most of Europe in with the West and then Russia and China. 
Russia and China are now standing with their guns, defending their gold, mining their gold, stacking their gold, and importing gold, while the West is using their guns to loot the gold from those who can't defend it, whether it's former OPEC or former NATO or current NATO nations. And uh, that is what's really behind this thing. Who has the guns and where the gold is going? And we'll talk to you next time.